we did a patchwork on the summer one, so they're all being put up right now, and of course the ones that um, you guys uh, see during the day, like right now. Okay, so um, they should all be working from now on. Everything it seems is working. Uh, again, thanks for all the positive feedback, and uh, keep going. It'll just keep getting easier, I promise you. I promise you, promise you, okay? So we've done our first week of baby steps, and I think we're starting to walk now, you know, and um, we'll eventually be off and running, okay? So uh, why don't we get started on, uh, or get finished, I guess, with chapter one, okay? So uh, let's talk about some of these basic units of time, temperature, specifically temperature, uh, time when we're talking about metric. The cool thing about time is that metric and English units are the same. It's the second, that's the basic unit. Temperature we're going to have to uh, do a little bit more work with because of course in the United States, again, we're more familiar with uh, dealing with the Fahrenheit scale, so most of the temperature readings that we see are in Fahrenheit. Of course, um, you know, the metric system isn't going to make it easy on us for anything, right? So uh, we've got to learn the metric system of temperature, and that is Celsius, okay? So what we're going to be learning is actually three different uh, temperature scales. The last one is Kelvin. Um, the Kelvin temperature is uh, an absolute temperature scale. The other two temperature scales, Celsius and Fahrenheit, are based on uh, <coughs> uh, things that people have found through nature. Like, in, for example, the Celsius scale is based on the freezing and boiling point of water. Okay, so they set zero at the freezing point of water and 100 at the boiling point of water, and then just made degree increments, a hundred of them uh, in between. Uh, the cool thing about the Kelvin scale is that the, um, the degree unit is the same uh, amount, if you will, as the Celsius scale. Unfortunately, the Fahrenheit scale is really kind of far out. Um, the Fahrenheit scale was based on body temperature with uh, 100 being average body temperature. Of course, this was before we could get very good temperature measurements and probably you guys know that normal body temperature isn't 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a little bit low, right? So uh, they based it on that. So we're going to kind of uh, want to be able to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius and we'll probably use Celsius and mostly Kelvin in this class. Okay, so most of our temperature readings at the when we start doing chemistry problems are going to be in the Kelvin scale. But I think it's um, very beneficial to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius and then to Kelvin. Okay, so um, you can see these three thermometers here. You see body temperature, um, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 37 degrees Celsius. Boiling point of water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius. Freezing point of water, 0, 32, 273. Those are three numbers you're wanting to, you're going to want to remember. It'll make your life a lot easier. Um, and then you've got these two equations here. And these equations will help you uh, convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. In fact, this is how you do it. Um, let's see. Let's try to do some conversion. I'll throw the temperatures up there, or the conversions up there. So these are two uh, equations, probably the first two equations that you're going to need to memorize for the test, OK? So you're not going to have any sort of note card or anything for the first test. So I want you to commit these things to memory, because of course you're going to have to convert uh, from Celsius to Fahrenheit on the first test. Let's go ahead and convert uh, 75 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. So how do we do that? Which one Which one of these two equations do you think we'll use, the top or the bottom one? <coughs> the bottom one, right? Because we want to get Fahrenheit. So 
first of all, write that equation down. So degrees Fahrenheit equals 1.8 times degrees Celsius plus 32.
This is the only temperature on both scales that's the same number. Okay, so at negative 40 degrees Celsius, it'll be negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Probably a lot of you already knew that from doing your extra problems or whatever. Okay, um, and in fact, uh, this number two here, if we look at this answer here, it's got one too many significant figures. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is just put a decimal point behind that zero there, and that'll make make it all good. Okay. Okay, so uh, I was referring to the Kelvin temperature scale uh, two minutes ago. The Kelvin temperature scale is an absolute temperature scale. What does that mean? So what we really want to think about in temperature, or what temperature is actually telling us, is that is the amount of energy the particles that are that temperature have. Okay? So temperature is actually a measurement of energy. I know we think it's a measurement of being hot or being cold, but what it really is is the vibrational energy of the particles. Okay, so the more vibrational energy you give them, the hotter they become. The, the more energy you take away from these particles, the less they vibrate. Okay, so um, the temperature scale is based on that. It's based on an absolute measurement. So what does that mean? That means at absolute zero, or zero on the Kelvin scale, there is no more particle or molecular vibration. Okay? The absolute zero has never been able to get to. Nobody's ever been able to get to it. I think that the lowest temperature people have been able to get to in the lab is like, 0, 0, 0, 0004 or something like that, Kelvin. So it's very, very close to absolute zero, but not, not to where particle motion actually stops. Okay? So um, it is very important, and in fact, what you'll find is most of the calculations you do in this class will depend on the absolute temperature. So I want you to get a really good feel for the absolute temperature. The cool thing about the Kelvin scale is that the degrees are exactly the same magnitude as the Celsius scale. So they're only off by this number here, 273. So what does that mean? That means that water freezes at 273 degrees above absolute zero. Okay. Water boils at 373 degrees Celsius, that is, above absolute zero. Okay? So, I think, do we have some? Yeah. Let's convert 75 degrees Celsius to Kelvin. So, go back here, write down that equation.
it also has the units associated with it. So let's try this other one. Convert 502 Kelvin to degrees Celsius. Now remember, you only have to memorize the one equation because you can algebraically manipulate that to give you degrees Celsius. So we'll start with that equation. K equals degrees Celsius plus 273. And all we got to do is subtract 273 from both sides. That cancels there. Okay, so we get the new equation is degrees Celsius equals Kelvin minus 273.
bottom of any mixture that you have. Okay? So in this case, what you find is mercury with a density of 13.6 grams per mil. That's a very, very dense substance. Okay? In fact, this is the most dense liquid that, that I know. Um, brass must be less than 13.6 grams per mil or grams per cubic centimeter. Why is that? Because it's floating on top of the mercury. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Uh, the water must be less dense than the brass. Why is that? Because the brass did what? Sink in the water, right? So if you throw a rock in water, it sinks, right? That's because the rock is more dense than the water. It's not heavier than the water, right? If I throw a rock in a river, the river is enormous, right? The river is enormous. How much mass of water is there in a river? Much more mass than that rock, right? So it's not the mass that's doing this. It's the mass per unit volume. So the mass per unit volume of water is much, much less than the mass per unit volume of brass. That's why it sinks. And then, of course, quartz must be the least dense of these materials. That's why it's floating on top of the water. Okay? Does that make sense? So it's an uh, inherent property of these substances, okay? And it's this property of mass per unit volume that you need to think about. Not just mass, not just volume. So let's calculate the density. Let's calculate uh, the density of aluminum. Aluminum is usually a solid, right? Usually a solid at room temperature. It definitely is a solid. Uh, so it's going to be in units of grams per cubic centimeter. So let's go ahead and figure this out. So what I would always do, what I always do, is take the initial um, measurement, or the initial equation, density equals mass over volume. And then what I'll do is say, okay, the volume equals 2.00 
Okay, so we're going to have to convert one to the other because we can't we can't do it. We can't we need to cancel out this volume unit. Okay, so let's go ahead and convert this to liters since we're talking about a gaseous sample. Okay, and liters is a more appropriate uh, volume term to use. So how would we do that? How many milliliters are there in a liter? Everybody? A thousand, right? So make sure you guys know that because that's a conversion I'm not going to give you. So we got 1,000 milliliters per one liter. Notice milliliters cancel, cancel, and what do we get? This divided by that, multiplied by that. So we'll take 0 0.0013 times 1,000, and I got 1.3 grams per 1 liter. Okay. Notice I only put two significant figures in that calculation. Why? Because there's only two significant figures here. So, we're looking for mass here. We're not looking for density. So, we're going to have to do something to this equation to get mass, to isolate the m variable. That's the way you would want to think about it. So, what will we do? Multiply both sides by v. v cancels there. And we get m equals vd. So M, that's cool because that's what we're looking for here. We've got volume in liters and uh, density in grams per liter. So when liter, liters cancel out, we're going to get a mass unit, right? And that's cool too because we're looking for a mass. Okay, so volume, 6.0 liters multiplied by 1.3 grams per one liter. So that's why I write it this way, so I'll have it actually on the denominator already. Okay? So when we do that, remember this is the numerator, it's only one below there, liters cancels with liters. And what do we end up with? Grams over here. Okay? So if you do this in the appropriate fashion, uh, it will, you can't help but get the right answer because the units will cancel out for you. Okay. So when we do this, we multiply 6 times 1.3. What did you guys get? 7.8. Why do you only say 7.8 and not 7.8? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> two six six, right? Why? Because we got two six six here, two six six here. So the answer is going to have two six six. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Cool. I'll let you guys do the other one on your own. Um, I think you guys can do it. I have full faith in you. And I can give you the answer, but make sure it's the right answer. Um, and there's some more density calculations. Let's do this lead brick one. This is why uh, solids are usually um, given densities in uh, grams per cubic centimeter because it's easy to measure, you know, if I have a brick or something, say this is a lead brick, I could measure that many, mil uh, that many millimeters to that many millimeters to that many millimeters. Okay, it's very easy to measure because the meter stick is quite readily available. So uh, let's just set this problem up and then I'll let you calculate it on your own. Remember, you got to memorize this V equals M over V. So now we have two, three equations that you need to know. The uh, Kelvin to Celsius, the Celsius to Fahrenheit, and density equals mass over volume. Okay, what does it say? The dimensions of the brick, remember, these dimensions are going to be length times width times height. Okay, that gives you the volume, of course. So the length or width or height, whatever it is, is 5.08 centimeters. Uh, the width is 10.2 centimeters. And the height is 20. 
point three seconds. And remember volume. Remember from high school geometry or whatever. Volume equals length times width times height. So when we do that, we get 5.08 centimeters times 10.2 centimeters times 20.3 centimeters. So what's our units going to be here at the end? Centimeters cubed. Why do you say that? Why do you say that? Because it's what? Centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. Okay? So that would be centimeters cubed. You guys are awesome. Good job this morning. I know it's early.
not going to go specifically to one side of the calculator. Systematic error, on the other hand, is errors that contain a bias either above or below the accurate measurement. Okay? This would be like if you, I don't know, have a scale or a balance at home that you set to maybe five pounds under zero. So you might think, oh, I'm losing weight, I'm losing weight. Or five pounds above zero, I'm gaining weight. I know I used to do that one when I was much younger, right? So you see, all of the points here, systematically, uh, will be above the correct value because your balance is inherently incorrect, okay? So you've got some sort of systematic error in your measuring device. Your measuring device is consistently giving you an answer that's above the correct answer. So notice the difference between this systematic and this random. Okay, precision, this tells you how close is my value to another value, the other values I get. Okay? So here we see we got high precision, all the values are essentially the same. Here we've got high precision too. All the values are essentially the same. Okay? So even if you have a systematic error, you can still be very precise. This is like if I'm a dart thrower and I don't consistently hit the bullseye, but I consistently hit the number 11 on the outside of the board. Okay? So like that, I'm very precise, always hitting that 11. Okay? Not very accurate because I want to hit the bullseye, but I keep hitting the, the wrong spot, so I'm very precise. Accuracy, on the other hand, would be, can I hit the bullseye? Can I hit that right target? Okay. And in fact, it's the average measurement of all of your uh, different attempts. So here, even though none of the attempts actually hit the bullseye, the average of them would be hitting the bullseye, if you will, right? Hitting this number, if we averaged all those points out, we can imagine it would get close to that dashed line, okay? So we would say that's very accurate. Um, and another one, whoops, this here, ah, is both precise and accurate. They're all consistent, and the average hits that dashed line. And you can see here, high precision, high accuracy. High precision, low accuracy. High, uh, low precision, but high accuracy. Okay, because it's the average of all of your points. Um, okay, and the scientific method. This is the approach that you're going to be using in this class and any other science class that you ever take and any other anything really that you ever do, right? Because if you do something and it doesn't work, you're not going to do it again, right? Like if I, I don't know, touch this thing and it shocks me, right? I'm not going to do it again. I have used the scientific method. Or if I do it and I say, oh, will it happen again if I do it? Bam, and it shocks me again, I'll stop doing it. Okay, that's what a scientific, the scientific method is in a nutshell. You observe a natural phenomenon, I touch that thing, it shocks me. I formulate a question. I wonder if it'll shock me every time I touch it. Do you recognize a pattern? Oh, it shocked me again when I touched it. It shocked me again. So I'm going to formulate a hypothesis. It's going to shock me every time I touch this thing. So I can perform experiments. Uh, touch it, touch it, touch it. If it shocks me every time, then 
by proving my hypothesis true. Or if maybe one time it doesn't shock me, right? Then my hypothesis needs to be changed a little bit, right? Maybe every tenth time it doesn't shock me, you know? So if true, if it shocks me every time or shocks me nine out of ten times or something like that, then, and I've made this statement and I've experimented it years and years and years and years, then that hypothesis becomes a model. And then further experimentation by many, many other people, many other scientists doing the same experiment as me will take that model and add further validity to it if they get the same result, right? And that model then becomes a theory. And then, of course, uh, after a while, after hundreds of years of doing these same experiments, that theory then becomes a law, okay? The very few laws of nature. Um, so, 